bit, and then we're going to talk about finding composite functions using numbers from graphs and tables. Should be really easy. Should be. Let's see. All right, we're going to test it. All right, finding the domain of rational function. What makes the denominator equal zero? That cannot be in our domain, right? Yes. That's what we're looking for. Anything that makes our denominator equal zero is a restriction. So we're going to solve and exclude it from our domain. So in this case, I have x minus 6 in my denominator. Figure out what would make it equal zero. 6. In this case, it's 6. So we'd add 6 on both sides. x cannot equal 6. All right. So I need to write my domain. Hey, are we all okay if I just use interval notation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Since that's what we have to use on the test? Yeah? Yep. All right. So interval notation then says I'm going to go from negative infinity to 6 union 6 to infinity. Right? I'm putting a union wherever it says can't equal something. So I'm jumping over that number. It can be any number between negative infinity and 6. Give me any number between 6 and infinity, but it cannot be 6. All right? So that's my domain. Make sense? Yes? Okay. Quinton. So when we have a restriction, we always have to have two? Like if it says x cannot equal a number, you will have two separate pieces. If it says x cannot equal this number and that number, so every number that it cannot equal, you're going to have a union. So like we had one restriction, so it's going to have one union. There'll be one later on on this page where it's got two. So the next one, 9 minus 2x. Same thing. 9 minus 2x can't equal 0. Well, solve for x. Minus 9. Minus 9. Negative 2x cannot equal negative 9. So we're going to divide by negative 2. x cannot equal 9 halves. Right, I have one restriction, means which, which means I'm going to have one union. I'm going to go from negative infinity to 9 halves. <coughs> union, and then I'm going to go from 9 halves to infinity. And that will be my domain. We're excluding anything at all that will make our denominator equal zero. We just say 4.5. You want to say 4.5? I would accept that. Now, if it's a decimal that comes out, or if it's a fraction that comes out to not a nice decimal, I'd ask you to keep it as a fraction. So I don't want you to round. All right, um, x minus two over x cubed plus x. This one's a little bit different. It's a little bit tougher, right? I'm gonna set x cubed plus x equal to zero. How do I know it's going to make that equal zero? What do you think I should do? Give you a hint. It starts with an F. Factor. Can you foil that? Is there any way to foil that? All right, we're going to factor. Factor a GCFO, right? Take an X out of both. X times X squared plus one equals zero, right? And just like when you factor, set each piece equal to zero. It should be a not equal. Yeah. Okay. So set each piece. Take x cannot equal zero. That's one restriction. Then I'm going to see is there a restriction for that second piece? So x squared plus one can't equal zero. Subtract one. X squared can't equal negative one. How do I figure out what type of restriction I'm going to get there? <coughs> if I try and square root this, what happens? Can't be I. I can't do it. So what that tells me then is there is no restriction for that part. No matter what value I put in for x of x squared plus 1, it will be a positive number. It won't be 0, I should say. All right? So no matter what value goes in for x, it's going to, be, it's going to work. So there's no restriction for this one. No restriction. Now, I still have x cannot equal 0. So I still have that restriction. Still need to put that in my domain. So I'm going to go from negative infinity to 0, union 0 to infinity. That's my domain. So sometimes there will be parts of our denominator that physically cannot equal 0. 
And x squared plus 1, no matter what number you put in there, will never equal 0. Okay? Does that make sense? Do you have any questions? Okay, we have one more problem I'd like to try. 1 over x squared minus 9x plus 20. My denominator, x squared minus 9x plus 20 equals 0. Can't equal 0, excuse me. What should I do here? Split up, factor it again, right? Becomes x minus 5, x minus 4. Can't equal 0. So then take each piece. See what would make each piece equal 0. X minus 5 can't equal, can't equal 0 plus 5. X can't equal 5. Right? X minus 4 can't equal 0. X can't equal 4. So now I have two restrictions, which means how many unions am I going to have? Two. Two, two of them. Right? Four. So I'm starting negative infinity, smallest number on the left, working to the biggest number on the right. So negative infinity to four. Four. Union. Four to five. Union five to infinity. You don't put a union when you get a wrong test. Yes. Because that union symbol, that means it's combining those things into one statement. Right? Separately, they're just all separate statements. You must put a union in here. So you must put that U. U. It's a math term. It's stupid. All right, guys, questions? Soldier Boy tells us, right? Wonderful. All right. Wonderful. Hey, finding domain from even root functions. So, taking square roots, right? Find domain. What makes it negative? So we want to make sure that a radical is not negative. So 10 minus x greater than or equal to 0. So we want positive values, right? Greater than 0. Subtract 10. Negative x greater than or equal to negative 10. I don't want negative x, though. So you have to divide by 1. Divide by negative 1 or multiply by negative 1. What happens to my inequality sign when I divide or multiply by a negative? Flip it. it flips, right? So it becomes x is less than or equal to 10. Now, when we're talking about radicals and we're talking about inequalities, we will not have that union. Right? What's going to happen is, what's the smallest value that x can be because of that restriction? Negative. 10. That'll be my number on the left. And I'm putting a bracket around it because it's or equal to. Right? The smallest number, excuse me, smallest that's number. wrong. Wait, yeah. Smallest number it's is less than, you're right, you're right, I was wrong. The greatest number is 10. The greatest number is 10, so 10 should be on the right. 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 My mistake. And I'm putting a bracket around it because I'm including it. What is the smallest number x can be? Negative infinity. Negative infinity, right? It just keeps going. It's less than 10, so negative infinity. So that is my domain. My bad. I mean... Hey, 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 your apology, hey. Okay, that's all right. What? My bad. Not my B. My B. My B, Q. No. Oh. You! <laughs> 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 there was a kid in middle school, because I came up when I was in middle school, that knew that whole dance by heart, and at one of the school dances would stand up on the stage and do that dance in front of everyone. Was it you? <laughs> it was not oh. me. That is definitely what I heard it. <laughs> that is something Patrick would do. Oh, I all right, let's try another one. 2x minus 3 under the radical. So, 2x minus 3 greater than or equal to 0. Well, get x by itself. Add 3. Add 3. 2x greater than or equal to 3. Divide by 2. Divide by 2. x is greater than or equal to 3 halves. Or if you want to put 1.5, you can put 1.5. So my inequality now, right, not my inequality, my domain, right, in interval notation, the smallest number it will ever be is 3 halves, and it's or equal to. So I put a bracket and then comma infinity because it goes greater than. That's my domain. 
Right. One more problem with domain. We have 33, I think. Can we reassess that for that? Well, no, we have some other things we have to do. <laughs> All right, 3x plus 1 over square root of x minus 9. Same thing, I have a radical here. So x minus 9 greater than or equal to 0. So add 9, add 9. x greater than or equal to 9. But hold on, what if it equals 9? It can't. It can't because that would make my denominator equal 0. Right, if I plug 9 in, I get 0 in my denominator. I can't have that. So instead of x is greater than or equal to 9, it's now just x is greater than, x is greater than 9. Anytime you have a radical in your denominator, it's going to be just greater than x. It can't be equal to that number. All right? So then my domain, small number will be as 9, but now it's a parenthesis. It's not or equal to. And then infinity. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Jalen, question? No. I mean, yeah, but I figured it out. Okay. All right, wait, wait, I got one more question. Might be a stupid question, but it's just a question. It's going to be a question. All right, so when do you use the greater than, less than symbols? And no, 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 because Draw the sometimes key. you use the greater than. <laughs> yep. And then sometimes you just use greater than. Yes. So well, you use greater than and you use greater than or equal to. Yeah, greater than, yeah. I'm greater than or equal to is what we always start with. Always start with that. Now, if it's in the denominator, then it just becomes greater than because we can't have it equal or, or our denominator will equal zero. Okay? All right, cool. 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 All right. <laughs> Finding function values from a graph. Once you get to hang this, it's going to be super easy. Right? You've done this before. I believe we did this, didn't we? Where we said find f of 2. Well, normally we would, we would plug 2 in for x, right? Yeah. So I'm going to say x equals 2. What I want to find now is the y value at x equals 2. So look at my graph. x equals 2, what's my y value? So that equals 1. F4. F of 4. So I look where 4 is? 5. Right, so this is x equals 4. Now find x. When f of x equals 5, so where y equals 5, zero. 0 and 4. So there's two answers. 0, 4. Yeah, you can just put a comma. x equals 0 and 4. It's pretty easy, right? Yeah. f of negative 2, so where x equals negative 2. Negative 2. y is 9. F of 0, so our x equals 0, y equals 1. Find x when f of x equals 2. So if y equals 2, negative 1. x equals negative 1. So it's just finding those values off your graph. Now, so we all agree that was pretty easy. We've done that before, right? Now let's do it a little more difficult. Where it's using composite functions to do that. Hey, when we have composite functions, which way do we work? Inside, Inside out. out. Inside out. Same thing here. So using the graphs of f of x and g of x, let's solve these. So first thing I'm going to do is find g of 2. So where x equals 2 on my g of x graph. Right, so where x equals 2. So x equals 2, my y value is? Two. So, so then I'm gonna take two and plug it in for comes f of two. So now on my f of x graph, where x is two, zero. y is zero, so it equals zero. So it work inside out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. G of one. So on the g graph, g of x graph, where x equals one, y equals three. So it becomes f of 3. Or x is 3, y is 2. So it equals 2. Same thing, f of 2, y equals 0, so g of 0. Then where x is 0, y is 4, my g of x graph, so it equals 4. Okay? Any questions on that? I know I kind of went through it really quickly, but any questions? I was, that was my, like, the easiest part of the unit. 
Okay, then the table, same sort of thing. But now I have an x column, so this is what x equals. When x equals these things, this is going to be what f of x equals and what g of x equals. So I'm going to do the same sort of thing. First thing I'm looking for, g of 0. So I'm going to let x equals 0. Look at g of x. It equals 4. So now it becomes f of 4. So our x equals 4. f of x equals negative 2. So that's my answer. Does that make sense? So f of 4. First thing we look for in the second problem. I get negative 2. So then g of negative 2. Negative 2, g of x is negative 7. Any questions on that? Okay. 12 minutes. What? We got 12 minutes. 12 minutes, perfect. We have one problem left. Well, there's two parts to it, but there's one problem. So there's a very good chance you might see a problem like this on something really important coming up when I won't be here. I don't know. So what's going to happen is we might give you like an application problem or a word problem, and it's going to give you both of our functions that we're going to use. Right? So you give us both the functions we're going to use, and you need to do composite functions with it, and you may have to answer a question with it. All right? So this problem, in the quantity, if the quantity of a product manufactured during a day is given by n of t equals 50t minus t squared. So what that's telling me is in one day, or excuse me, in certain amount of days, t is time, I get 50t minus t squared. That's how much I manufacture. The cost of manufacturing that product is 10n plus 1,375. So this is how much is manufactured in one in a day or during days. This is how much it costs to manufacture the product. It wants to know, find a function that gives the cost of manufacturing the product in terms of the number of hours t the assembly line is functioning. In other words, it tells you it wants C of N of T. It'll probably tell you that on that really important thing too. All you have to do is do this composite function. So take, we have C of N of T, right? What is N of T? 50T minus T squared. So this becomes C of 50T minus T squared. So now anywhere in that C function that we have up here, that you see in this case an N, we're going to replace it with 50T minus T squared. So it becomes 10 times 50T minus T squared plus 1,375. What do you think I should do to that? So I distribute and then combine my like terms if I have any. So distribute. 500t minus 10t squared plus 1,375. If you want to flip those, you can. If that bugs you, you want to log to it kind of bugs me, so I'm going to flip them. But So I know c of n of t equals negative 10t squared plus 500t plus 1,375. That's my answer. Hey, just doing that composite function. Don't get all freaked out by all these numbers, by all those words. Literally, it's going to give you your two functions. It just wants you to do the composite of them. Okay? Yes, Jalen? Are we going to have to do like a domain? Um, I can't imagine so. But what would the domain of that be? Negative infinity to infinity, right? So, now the second part asks, find the cost of production on a day when the assembly line was running for 16 hours. Well, what do you think I'm going to do? Plug 16 in for t. Plug 16 in for t into that equation we just created. So if t equals 16, plug it in. Negative 10 times 16 squared plus 500 times 16 plus 1,375. And then, punch in the calculator.
What do we get? 6,850. So you got 6,815. Missing something? Dollars. Dollars, right? We're talking about the cost. So $6,815. So don't get freaked out by a problem like that.